was a 911 dispatcher for almost 11 years. 11 long years of receiving the calls of everyone from entitled do-gooders to terrified pleading victims of serious violent crimes. I spent a long time compartmentalizing the more harrowing calls, years letting go of the pain and suffering I soaked up like a sponge during the years I spent sat in front of a switchboard computer. I've had numerous sleepless nights, countless visits to state-appointed therapists, but only one emergency call really sticks with me, one that I could not never shake off or push to the back of my mind. I have a copy of the transcripts to the call, so I'll be referencing my copy to ensure my recollection of the events are as accurate as possible. This is the story of the Ashland Jane Doe. Working in more than 6,000 call centers nationwide, 911 dispatchers form the vital link between callers in distress and emergency response teams that assist them. Through efficient handling and assessment, we reduce response times and help save lives. That's the idea that got me into the career in the first place, saving lives. I'd never been particularly athletic, so a career in law enforcement or the military was never really in the cards for me. That always bothered me. I grew up intensely idealistic, and I've always had my heart set on a career where I could help people, help make the world a better place. So when I found out that I could apply to be a 911 dispatcher and help play a part of such a vital public service, I jumped at the chance. We were told that the job wasn't for everyone, that it could take a serious psychological toll on those that volunteered. I know it sounds crazy, but that only made it more appealing. It was, after all, public service, service being the operative word. It would be rough, frustrating, even depressing sometimes but I would be providing a much-needed aid to my fellow Americans, often during the darkest, most terrifying moments of their lives. I should also add that it requires specialist training to be a police dispatcher. Being a general call taker or even an emergency medical service dispatcher is a tough gig, but a police dispatcher was a cut above and we all knew it. Only the most intelligent, strong-willed, and decisive candidates are granted roles as police dispatchers. So naturally, I was over the moon when I passed the applicant's exam and was given a place on the training course. I was a pretty experienced member of the police dispatchers when the call from Ashland Jane Doe came through. Just a few hours into my shift, I recently returned from the break room with a flash of strong black coffee to fuel me throughout the night. He always seemed to say a little prayer whenever a call is patched through, hoping it's nothing too serious, nothing too upsetting. But as soon as I heard the girl's voice, I knew it would be bad. You see, screamers are bad. You can barely hear them, they're incoherent, and basically you have to spend like the first five minutes of the call just getting them to breathe enough to communicate. But the worst by far are the whispers. The whisperers call when whatever is putting them in danger is close, real close. Whisperers do so because they are in grave, imminent danger. Whisperers call because they're being hunted. 911, what is the address of your emergency? I asked. The call had already been picked up by a general call taker, patched through to me once it established that the caller needed the police. Right across from the 4th Street laundromat. There was a slight pause before the girl whispered. The fact that she didn't know exactly where she was gave me a terrible sinking feeling. This is going to be a rough one. What's the problem? I replied, trying to sound as casual as possible. Younger callers seem to respond better that way. I've been abducted. The way she sounded so calm, so matter of fact, it was utterly chilling. There was no hope in the girl's voice even though she was so close now to rescue. But you're at the laundromat? I asked, consulting a map of the area. It was right in the middle of Ashland, surrounded by a commercial and residential district. She wasn't held up in some barn in the middle of nowhere despite being thoroughly disturbed. I reassured myself with the thought that this would be an easy rescue. No, I'm in the bedroom with him. Him. The words seemed to rattle around in my skull. She was in the bedroom with him. Do you know what color the house is? I tried to change the subject slightly to garner more information, sure, but 
also to try to keep the girl calm, keep her mind occupied. No, was all she said. This was a spanner in the works, a big one. The police can't just go kicking in the door of every apartment or house opposite the 4th Street laundromat, yet before I could press her for more detail, she spoke again. Please hurry. My heart rate began to pick up at this point. She was obviously in danger, perhaps extreme danger. I had to remain professional and continue my assessment of the situation. Does he have a weapon? I asked already preparing to send out an APB to muster the officers required for a rescue. Got a taser. She lowered her voice even further as she spoke, but still she didn't seem overwhelmed by fright. I considered for a moment that whoever was may have drugged the poor girl to keep her sedated. Are you injured? A little. Her whisper was haunting by the point. She sounded like she'd been driven half insane by the ordeal. Is there any way you can get out of the building? I don't know. Without waking him, I'm scared. She was broken by fear, numb with it. Is there a bathroom in the house? I remember my voice breaking. I was so scared for this poor little thing. I wanted so, so badly for her to just drop the phone and run. Run for her life. His bedroom is closed and he made it he made it so it would make noise. Will he do something to you? I'd never been so intense, not during my entire time as a dispatcher. Yeah, he had me tied up. Are you tied up now? Well No, I I'm kinda I kinda freed myself. That's my girl, I remember thinking. She was a fighter, a survivor. She suddenly said, I, I think I woke him. I think I woke him up. Just set the phone down. My heart was in my mouth. There was silence, what seemed like minutes of uninterrupted silence as I half expected the screams to commence. Finally, I brought myself to say something, anything down the silent phone line. Are, are you still there? H how much longer? was all she asked. It broke my heart. I didn't know. I just didn't know. I kept her on the line as I immediately dispatched officers to the laundromat. Luckily, there were only two houses immediately opposite the place in what was otherwise an industrial complex. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I finally heard the voices of the dispatch officers. They'd broken into the house of the kidnapper and were in the process of freeing the poor girl from captivity. Show me your hands. Put up your effing hands right now. Do it. I heard one of them bellow. I held back tears knowing that that poor young woman was finally safe. Safe from him. She was most definitely in danger too. When the police searched the house, they found the bodies of two other young women that had disappeared in the months before the critical 911 call. Jane Doe is called that because her identity cannot be revealed standard procedure for all victims of assault. Her abductor, Sean Michael Great, was found guilty of murdering Stacy Stanley and Elizabeth Griffith, and was later sentenced to death for his crimes. During the trial, he stated that despite having killed before, he had no intention of killing the kidnapped Jane Doe and was in fact intending to marry her. That's what really gets to me. The thought of the brutal, potentially short life that poor girl would have ended up living as the unwilling bride of such a murderous, unfeeling psychopath. Where she would be if she hadn't loosened her bindings, found the phone, and called in her own rescue on that fateful spring night. Ask a cop which day of the year they dread working the most. One or two might answer Christmas or Super Bowl Sunday, and I get that. But 9 out of 10 will give you the same tired look before they utter one single word. Halloween. Halloween might just be some light-hearted spooky fun for some, but for law enforcement, it's no joke. 
The small New England town I serve in has a spike of about six or seven times the number of emergency calls on Halloween night alone. It really does bring out the absolute worst in people. I mean, there's the stuff we anticipate every year. Ungenerous houses having suffered a barrage of weaponized eggs, trees covered in toilet paper, homeowners complaining of juvenile trespassers. Those calls are manageable, but they bog down our on-duty officers so that when serious crimes happen, we're dangerously under strength. But all of the dumb Halloween mischief I've had to respond to over the years... All of it pales in comparison to what I found at the house on the end of Jefferson Street. That was a Halloween night I don't think I'll ever forget. I just responded to a call regarding a group of teenagers who had apparently been engaging in some pretty aggressive trick-or-treating, all without costumes. That type of stuff is exactly why I hate Halloween. No, what they were doing wasn't strictly illegal, but I can't exactly have a bunch of knuckle-draggers making trouble on a night like that, especially not with the hundreds of excited children roaming the streets. I lecture them. They roll their eyes, but I join the force to get into car chases with bad guys, not argue semantics with a bunch of stone brats. They walk away, muttering stuff that I choose to ignore while I get back in my patrol car. The radio almost immediately buzzes to life. My dispatcher says something over the radio involving this rundown house over on Jefferson Street. I start the car up, listening as he describes a member of the public calling to report that the house has Halloween decorations that were too scary. She then says it's the second call that day and I should go over and check it out if I have a minute to spare. She always did have a sense of humor. She knew well I was off my feet. We had a little laugh about it. Like I said, we get some seriously ridiculous calls on Halloween. It's not just dumb kids. It's bitter, old misers and party poopers who honestly just resent people having a good time. This one good Christian lady calls us every year over trespassing trick-or-treaters, on kids, who calls the cops on actual children. Anyway, I carry about my duties, responding to calls and generally keeping an eye out for trouble. A few hours slip by, the sun sets... The smaller kids, led by their parents, disappear back into their homes until it's just a few older groups on their way to parties and whatnot. Then, the dispatcher gets on to me about this house on Jefferson. She says she had three more calls about the decorations, how they're scaring kids and even some parents, and she needs me to roll over there to check it out. Great. Arguing with some slasher movie-obsessed hermit who's probably about to get all sovereign citizen on me, just what I need to make me feel like a guardian of the innocent. Sometimes I feel like the world's grumpy stepfather, honestly. So I take the ride over there, to this smaller part of town that's a little more run down, arriving on Jefferson. I see the house immediately. There was absolutely no missing it. The old colonial-looking place was covered in Halloween decorations. Cardboard standees of vampires and zombies, a ton of fake cobwebs all over the porch... I think I counted like 20 carved pumpkins dotted all over the lawn. Pretty intricate designs, too. But hanging from a large oak just to the side of the house was the most disturbing Halloween decoration I had ever seen. Not disturbing because it looked real. The limbs of the figure were too rigid, the hair a little too artificial. But the placement of the thing... It really did set me on edge as I stared out of the patrol car at it. The figure hung by a rope from... One of the oak tree's long, thick branches drifting gently in the fall breeze. Look, I'm a cop. I've seen some stuff. I don't frighten easily. I'm very logical, very level-headed, but that thing sent a shiver down my spine. I stepped out of the car, keeping my eyes glued to the hanging decoration as I walked towards it, the sound of crunching leaves under my feet with each and every step. Reaching for the flashlight on my belt, I pointed the torch beam over towards the tree. I could see why people had called this in. The texture on the thing's skin, it was very graphic, blotchy and purple, almost like an actual corpse. I only took another few steps before I felt extremely foolish for my previous thought. The smell, the sickly sweet smell of death hung in the air along with what I thought was just a cheeky decoration. It wasn't. 
It was an actual corpse that had been hanging there all day. Hundreds of kids must have walked past there, only a few of them actually recognizing that the thing hanging from the tree was a real cadaver. I felt sick. Sprinting back to my patrol car, I radioed into dispatch to get the coroner out to Jefferson Street as soon as possible. My dispatcher was absolutely horrified when she learned what I had, that other people had been staring at a dead body all day, many of them none the wiser. The hanged man was a one Richard Dodd, a retired teacher who was reported to have been caught up in some vigilante pedo sting. According to investigating officers, Mr. Dodd had been tricked into revealing questionable interest to individuals that were posing as an underage girl. When they threatened to go public with some of the more despicable things he said online, Mr. Dodd had opted for the easy way out. Systematically fashioning a rope and doing the deed, all without a thought for who might happen across his body. People give me a hard time for not being into Halloween as a holiday, for rolling my eyes when grown adults talk about how wasted they're going to get or what costume they had picked out. But if they knew the things that went on around them on that grisly night, things that are sometimes hiding in plain sight, I don't think they'd be so quick to celebrate. I was an emergency dispatcher for nine years before Katrina hit. The summer before my junior year of high school, I decided to get involved with law enforcement after doing a couple of ride-alongs with the police department. I had half expected them to be full of car chases, wailing sirens, taking down bad guys, but when I saw what they really did during their patrols, it completely changed my opinion of cops in general. It wasn't about being cool with a badge and a gun, it was more about community policing. They knew people by their first names, helped the elderly with their groceries, and kept local kids out of trouble. They were making a difference, not just two guys on a power trip gunning people down for no reason. So I started running the radio part-time on the weekends and during the summer when I was out of school, eventually moving into a full-time position after high school when a position opened up. It's not exactly illegal for someone under the age of 18 to work at a dispatch center, but I wasn't allowed to actually answer 911 calls without an APCO certified operator on the console with me until I was fully employed and fully qualified. And just so you all know, APCO stands for Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, and it's standard all over the country for people to get certified by them before they can work in dispatch centers. It was, however, very illegal for me to run the NCIC, National Crime Information Center, computer without being certified to do so, and there was absolutely no way of that happening until my 18th birthday. So I ran the medical and fire dispatch console for all of Mobile County when I was part-time, and got my certifications when I graduated. I was also a volunteer firefighter, EMR, during this time as well. Also not illegal and quite common in rural parts of Alabama, but I suppose that's all another story. I was a 911 operator in Mobile, Alabama the same day Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. We started getting lots and lots of calls from over in New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf Coast for some reason. I guess because they started routing through to us after all the 911 centers to the west started going down. Anyways, I got a call from a woman who said she was trapped in her house on Gordon Street between Florida and Law. I was confused at first because we have a Florida street here in Mobile and after checking and double checking and not being able to find her address, I asked her what city she was calling from. New Orleans came the reply. My heart sank. Water had completely flooded the ground floor of her home and was slowly gradually rising. I asked her if she could find any way out of the house, if there were any accessible windows on the second floor she could use. She said no, that she lived in a small single-story home that had an attic, and that was all. I tried to route her to New Orleans 911 and New Orleans Fire Department, but could not get through. Dispatch centers up and down the country were experiencing the same ridiculous volume of calls from the NOLA and Gulf Coast areas. When I finally did break through and reach a department somewhere, the lines were dead, 
brought down by the sheer ferocity that the hurricane brought. I tried to keep her calm, talking to her about her friends and family, the life she had before the storm arrived. She seemed like a popular woman. Her concerns were mostly for elderly relatives that were even less capable of protecting themselves than she was. I'll never forget that, the selflessness she displayed even when she was in such dire straits herself. When she said the water was waist high, I told her to climb up into her attic with some food and water to keep her going. She joked about emptying the fridge, taking everything up into the attic. Might as well finish off last night's leftovers if the refrigerator would need to be replaced. She was such a strong woman. It's amazing how the human spirit can bloom even in the worst of situations. Something I found time and time again while working those phones. After a while, I heard her voice begin to get panicky her breathing becoming short. She began to tell me that the flood water was beginning to leak up into the attic through the floorboards, how she didn't expect the water to have risen so much. I was stunned. I hadn't expected that either. In fact, it came as such an unwelcome revelation that I began to panic myself. Other than the roof, there was nowhere for the woman to escape to if the water kept rising. I asked her if there were any attic windows she could climb out of. She said no. By that point, I was starting to really worry. She was indeed trapped in an enclosed space with floodwaters rapidly rising. In desperation, I told her to find something heavy, something she could use to bash out the roof tiles or smash through a ventilation unit so she could escape onto the roof. For a painful few minutes, I heard her grunting and cursing as she used some unknown object to try to break her way out. I listened as the strikes grew weaker and less frequent. She soon returned to the phone with terrible news. I... I can't do it. I can't fit through the vent either. What am I going to do? She was panicking, shouting now about the amount of water seeping into the attic, how it was ankle height and rising fast. I honestly felt my heart break in my chest when I heard her voice break as tears formed in her eyes. She was crying, and she was losing hope. I told her I would stay on the line with her for as long as she wanted me to. I did so, staying on the line and listening as she cried, prayed, cussed, and prayed some more. A little while later I could hear her struggling to keep her head and phone above water, and then the phone went dead. To this day, I don't know if she lived or died. I quit the dispatch center about three months after Katrina. I booked myself into counseling sessions at a therapist's office over in downtown Mobile, hoping it could help me rationalize and compartmentalize some of the more horrific calls I had to handle. But I was surprised to hear that the therapist actually thought I should quit. He specialized in cop and dispatchers, the kinds of people who rub noses with the worst of the worst on a daily basis. He went on to explain that people only have so much of a capacity for trauma, how I may have just reached my limit. But I have no regrets. If I had to burn out the last of my wits staying on the line with that poor, ill-fated woman over in New Orleans, it was worth it. I'd do it all again in a heartbeat. The scariest thing that ever happened to me as a police officer here in the UK wasn't some horrendous terror attack or overly gory crime scene. The incidents that stick with you are the ones that involve what I like to call human drama. When you get an insight into just how terrifying a person's psyche can be and the things it can lead them to do. I arrived at my duty station at 6 o'clock in the morning. I had finished work at around 11 the previous night and ended up running into an assault on an old man on the way home. My journey into work was about an hour, so instead of getting home in a reasonable time, I get home after midnight. I have a quick bite with my wife and get to bed at around 1am, giving me about 3-4 to four hours of sleep before I'm back on duty. It's one of the worst things about my job. We're expected to go above and beyond on a daily basis. That, I can tell you, can prove to be completely and utterly exhausting. It frays their nerves, makes the emotions raw, and generally makes the job that little bit more difficult. Anyway, about 15 minutes into my early shift, 
I'm on station duties and a bloke comes in to tell us that he thinks his wife is missing. He seemed very reluctant to give us the details and at one point I have to drag information out of him. Essentially, they'd had some kind of domestic argument. She stormed out and didn't come home that night. I check her on the system and she's actually been previously arrested for a couple of domestic violence incidences. I dig a little deeper and I discover that they are actually against her son rather than her husband. Situations like this are rarely black and white, but this one was just all kinds of convoluted. Now at this point I am very, very tired and definitely not in the best of moods. I read over the notes I had written down and confirm some details, and then send the fellow home to wait for his wife. I call around the local hospitals, check our own police databases to make sure she hasn't been arrested. I circulate her details to all units in the area and then type out a digital report on the incident. After that, I'd done all I was obligated to do and technically there isn't actually anything else for me to do other than wait for my superior to provide guidance. I go and get a cup of coffee. All I wanted to do is sleep, but something is bothering me. Something about the husband. Despite no indicators of him having committed a crime, I was deeply suspicious of him. Whenever someone appears to be withholding information, there is always a reason, and the sooner we get to the bottom of that, the better. I went down to talk with the most senior officer available, asking him if I could go over to the guy's house have a look around and maybe talk to the husband again. The senior guy, this grizzled older sergeant, wasn't delighted with the suggestion because it meant that he'd have to cover the desk due to being short-staffed, but he agreed, and off I go. I arrived at the house and began to talk to the husband. I asked him if I can have a look around, explaining that there might be something that could shed some light on where she might have gone. I make a preliminary inspection of the house, finding several containers of pills with weird names. A quick Google search reveals that this woman appears to be on a cocktail of antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and the like. I also find an insulin kit, leading me to believe that if she's a diabetic, her life could be in danger without medication. I ask the husband about these, and he mentions that his wife has had some quote-unquote emotional problems. I proceed to sit him down, remarking that there is a lot of medication here, then asking him if his wife has more than one insulin kit. He goes pale at this point. She left all her medication at home. I ask him where she keeps her handbag and we end up checking her bedside cabinet. The handbag is missing, but I manage to take a look at a framed picture for future reference. I have absolutely no idea what this woman looks like, and ask her husband if I can search the room. He's beginning to completely break down at this point, and tells me I can do whatever it takes at this point to find his missing wife. Feeling distinctly uneasy at this point with a banging headache from sleep deprivation, I don't find any sign of missing clothes in the wardrobe or any secret stashes of cash or drugs. I don't know what led me to do it, but I decided to search the bed. I turned his pillow, and there's a note under it. It's a note explaining in no uncertain terms that the man's missing wife has the intention to end her life. The note goes on to say that she cannot go on, that she's sorry for being a burden. I radio back to the police station and update them on the situation. I'm then forced to return to the living room and tell this woman's husband that he had failed to notice that he had been sleeping on her note overnight. That was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. We found her eventually, though it took another eight hours or so to pin her down. We pinged her mobile phone to a nearby cell tower, but that just gave us a general locality. I tried to press the husband for information on where she may have gone, but he said that she didn't have any friends or family in the area. Later on, the husband telephones the police station and explains that they spent a weekend in a nearby seaside town shortly after they got married. I called the hotel they stayed in on that occasion, but they'd had no one by that name. I went down in person and showed them the picture. The little lady at the desk told me that a guest answering that description had just left for a walk on the pier. When I went out to the pier in question, there she was. She actually seemed quite calm, 
There was nothing overly dramatic about her appearance or demeanor. She actually had the cheek to tell me that I looked awful, to which I explained jokingly that it was partially her fault. I asked her to give life a chance for a few more days, that her husband loved her and that she wasn't a burden. She agreed and we brought her home. A couple of days later she came to the station with a box of chocolates and a thank you card. One of those generic kinds that in no way revealed just what she was thanking me for. It was deeply surreal to receive a card like that for preventing the ending of someone's life. The family sends a similar card every year around the anniversary of the events. A stark reminder of just how effective good police work can be. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a small rural town of around 2000. I post on a few different forums and I have my own blog, but we can be disciplined for posting details of our jobs on social media, so I'm sure you'll understand if I leave out a few intimate details here and there. Like I said, we're way out in the country and only have two or three officers on duty at a time, so I'm pretty much on my own for the most part. Fellow deputies provide a little backup if a serious call goes out or I actually radio for assistance, but said deputies are often out patrolling the opposite ends of the county and are usually 15 to 20 minutes away, even if they floor it and use their sirens, so I have to account for that in any situation I find myself in. When stuff hits the fan, I could be completely on my own for a prolonged period of time. 15 minutes may not sound like much, but when you're dealing with a violent tweaker or a berserk gunman, 15 minutes becomes a very long time. A few years back on chilly October night, I was cruising in my patrol car and getting kind of bored. At about 2 in the morning, a call comes over the radio asking for a welfare check on a house just a few miles out of town. A woman had called dispatch asking us to check up on her ex-husband. She was deeply concerned. He hadn't been acting himself lately. He'd been making strange calls to her house, drinking during the day, that sort of thing. Now, she said he wasn't answering her calls and she feared the worst. I radioed back to dispatch that I'd take the call. So, being that this call is outside my assigned area, it is technically the responsibility of the sheriff to handle it, or at least be on scene when a deputy made the actual welfare check. But since it was only a few miles down the road and there would be no chance of getting the sheriff out until morning, exceptions were made. It feels bad to say. I mean, someone's life could be in danger, but as I'm driving over, I find I'm actually getting pretty excited. See, the thing about welfare checks is, despite them being fairly regular calls, there's a possibility of a little door kicking. I'm not saying I like damaging people's property... I know I wouldn't be too happy if someone kicked my door from its hinges, but to be honest, stuff like that is what I joined the department for. That hardcore police work where you're kicking doors and cuffing bad guys. That and if it doesn't feel good just smashing that thing open and screaming sheriff's department, it never gets old. Now I know I sound egotistical, but having said that, welfare checks normally just consist of banging on some elderly person's door until they realize their hearing aids have ran out of battery. They fix them, I call it in, everyone goes home happy. But on the odd occasion you kick a door and the smell hits you, and you know, you just know, someone's gotta call the coroner. The house in question turns to be in the middle of some deep, dense woodland, my patrol car rocking on the bumpy, dirty road as it trundled along for about a quarter of a mile. I can see a single light on in the front bay window, always a good sign. I get out of my patrol vehicle, eyeing the surroundings before walking up to the front door. Under the beam of my torch, I could see why this guy's ex-wife was so concerned about him. He had not been keeping house while she was away. There was all kinds of garbage thrown around. Two beat up pickup trucks that looked like they hadn't run in years. An old pierogue that'd be more useful as firewood. Slowly, I give the guy's front door a few loud knocks. No answer. Doesn't surprise me, no one ever answers on the first knock. I give the thing a few hard knocks, the kind that makes my knuckles hurt. Still no answer. 
and patiently I radio dispatch and tell them I'm not getting an answer at the door. I then ask them to check our system for any contact details for the guy. Maybe they can get him on the phone and ask him to come to the door. He could have a barn out somewhere, maybe a basement, it's always worth a try. The call comes back way quicker than I expect. Dispatch tells me that they already have him on the line. He called into our dispatch center himself. All they tell them that he had some deputy knocking at his door and that he had his old Remington 700 aimed squarely at the back of their head. My head. He says if I leave now, no one will get hurt. I remember turning and looking in the darkness, not daring to shine my torch. I didn't want the guy to think it was the light on my sidearm. I didn't see a thing. Just a few trees in the moonlight, but, but somewhere... Hidden in the pitch black night was a man who was a trigger's pull away from sending my brains all over the peeling paint of his run-down front door. It was absolutely terrifying. At first I was weirdly calm about the whole thing. I think I was forcing myself to be not wanting to give the man with the rifle a reason to execute me. I kept my cool, at least until the last few steps before reaching my patrol car when I felt that sickening feeling of someone running up behind you. I jumped in my vehicle and revved the engine, gunning out of that death trap before the guy had a chance to take a few parting shots at me. This would have been nerve-wracking in the day, sure, but at night, I couldn't see a thing. There's literally no way of knowing where that guy was or if he was even rushing at me at all. Several hours later, he gave himself up. He was arrested for threatening a deputy. We all thank God that no one was hurt. Heck, it turned out he was just bluffing the whole rifle in the woods thing. He'd see me roll up and hit in the woods with a cell phone. Well, that's what he said anyway. All I know is that when we searched the house, we did actually find an old Remington 700 model with a bullet racked in the chamber. Like I said, visibility was awful so there was never any real evidence that he actually did have his rifle trained on me that night. But the feeling I got just as I reached my vehicle that night. I know, man. I know. I've been a police officer in central London for nearly four years now. Four years of violence, heartbreak, lies, and desperation. Things that have made that time stretch and bend, making four years seem like a lifetime. I can barely remember what kind of person I was before I joined the police. Some happy-go-lucky 20-something who just wanted to make a positive difference in their community. Now, I consider it a win if I go just one day without having to wash someone else's blood off my uniform. Years upon years of squeezing a stab victim's hand, trying to keep them awake before the ambulance arrives, comforting acid attack victims as they writhe in pain, restraining distraught mothers when their joy-riding sons skid on rain-sodden roads and wrap themselves around a lamppost. But I've never seen anything as horrifying as what I saw on a domestic abuse call just last night. This is not a story. I wish it was. This is merely what I saw on a small house in East End of London on a dark, freezing February night. Domestic abuse calls can be tricky to say the least. Often, the couple put their differences aside and unites against the intruding police presence. I've found nothing drains the human spirit like seeing a bruised and battered woman defending her monster of a husband from the very people trying to save her life. But this call was different. Horribly different. We were warned that a young woman was being subjected to female genital mutilation. This was the first time I'd ever attended such a call. The homes of West African families tend to be some of the most vibrant, well-decorated and well-kept households a person can ever lay eyes on. This one was not. It was dark and dingy, the walls covered in strange pictograms and symbols. Animal tails had been nailed to the kitchen wall, seemingly stuffed and preserved to keep them from decomposition. Another corner of the kitchen was decorated with the skulls of what I imagined to be the owners of the severed tails. I was numb with apathy when it occurred to me that some of the missing cat flyers posted on community notice boards would need to be taken down. 
Once the mother and father were arrested and the child victim taken into care, the search teams began to produce some of the most unsettling things I had ever seen during my time in the police. The first was a pair of cow tongues, tied up with yarn and frozen so they formed a solid pass of intertwined flesh. In the center was a nail, hammered through the both of them while they were still warm and soft. The search team then began to empty the home's refrigerator, producing a series of small, spherical objects wrapped in tinfoil. They were limes, sliced in half and concealing a number of small, scribbled notes. An accompanied social worker assigned to the family by the local council emerged from a bathroom, her face ghostly pale. She held a small glass jar containing a picture of none other than herself. It had been doused in what appeared to be ashes. One of the search team was a man of Nigerian descent, naturalized British but with knowledge of certain shadier Western African practices. With a sigh and sad look in his eyes, he told us what we had found was witchcraft or vodun, the practice of ancestor worship that believes the spirits of the dead live side by side with the world of the living each family of spirits having its own female priesthood, sometimes hereditary when it's from mother to blood daughter. We had apparently interrupted the process by which the matriarch of the family was passing on her knowledge to the young daughter. The tongues that were bound and nailed together were a defense against liars, purported to still their lying tongues. The limes containing incantations were a defense against evil spirits, the fruit thought to have a purging influence on the spirits of the dead. But the glass jar containing the photo and the ashes was something altogether more disturbing. The picture was evidently taken at a distance, the subject unaware that their image was being captured. The eyes had been scratched out, a single tiny cut placed across the figure's throat. It was a representation of a grave, supposed to will the death of the person inside of it. I couldn't understand why the social worker was so terrified, why she would be nearly brought to tears by what we all considered the unhealthy delusions of abusive parents. Now, nothing has come of this supposed witchcraft, but the extent that people will go for their ritualistic beliefs will forever stick with me. I've been an officer for the Montgomery County Police Department in Wheaton, Maryland for 18 years now. It's essentially a suburb of D.C. as we're only about 10 miles north of the Capitol building. Sure, it can get pretty crazy at times, but overall it's a good place to be a cop. We get considerably less violent crimes than the neighboring College Park and I'd consider us a community police force. Despite a few notable exceptions, nobody has an axe to grind with cops and we generally get a good response from citizens whenever we respond to dispatches. But even in a fairly quiet place like Wheaton, we still get some pretty insane police calls. Thanksgiving family fistfights, a homeless guy who used a kitchen showroom as a public bathroom, a woman who complained of trespassing squirrels. Yep, squirrels. Apparently they didn't ask permission to raid the oak tree in her backyard. Yet, I think the most disturbing call I ever responded to occurred on a warm summer night back in 2015. People can be cruel to one another, cruel and devious in ways that leave you pretty well desensitized. Sometimes, and I know this may sound callous, but people sort of deserve it. I once arrested a woman who stabbed her husband to death in his sleep, and it turned out he'd been beating her and abusing her for years when she finally just snapped. But the one thing you never, ever get used to is when the victim of a violent crime is overwhelmingly innocent, a child for example, or in this case, an animal. The night of June 4th seemed like pretty much any other. I was working third shift so I'd been on duty for about four or five hours, just rolling around the three major streets that make up the core of Wheaton's community. Wheaton is pretty tranquil, sure, but third shift is when the small cabal of shady types begin to converge on the three streets area. If left unchecked, they can cause quite a bit of mischief, minor thefts or drunk in public outside of the local liquor store. But I was never, 
ever expecting the call that came through as my shift crept into the wee small hours of Friday morning, one that made my blood boil as my dispatcher's voice buzzed on my patrol car's radio. It was a call to the intersection of Georgia and Price Avenues. A large African American male was said to be engaging in violent drug-related behavior, now we get the occasional call about pot smoking teenagers hanging around parking lots, but violent drug behavior is something we rarely come across. They also happen to be my least favorite calls. People on drugs aren't rational, they can't communicate properly, and most importantly when they see our blue flashing lights and big shiny badges, they panic. As you can imagine, an intoxicated subject who fears for their own life is extremely difficult to deal with. But as more details came through, I found myself throwing aside my reservations and rushing towards the scene. The man was said to be in possession of two small dogs, both of which he was in the process of strangling. Yes, you read that right. The guy was strangling two puppies in the middle of the sidewalk. I flicked my lights and siren on, putting pedal to the metal as I rushed across town. I just remember being so angry so livid at what I just heard, grinding my teeth and gripping the steering wheel so hard it had my knuckles turning white. Rolling up on the scene, I saw the guy pretty much straight away. Trust me, it's hard to miss a guy with a pit bull puppy in each hand, especially when they're writhing in pain, fighting against his iron grip on their little throats. It's weird how little details stick with you in these situations, while adrenaline seems to muddy everything else into a cloudy kind of memory soup. But I'll never, ever forget how one of the puppies had this almost golden tan fur. It reminded me of my childhood dog, a big Labrador that was, without a doubt, my best friend during my formative years. I pulled my taser almost instantly, shouting at the suspect to release the animals. He just ignored me, his muscles straining as he continued to choke both puppies. This is about the time my backup arrived my fellow officers looking just as furious as me when they saw just what was going down. One of them told me not to deploy the taser yet. If the suspect's bodies tensed up with the shock, we'd never get those poor puppies free from his grip. I kept the device trained on him as other officers grabbed hold of the other guy's arms, trying in vain to get him to release the animals. God, the kind of strength he displayed was absolutely terrifying. I watched the strongest guy in our department, Hernandez, struggle to gain control of just one of this guy's arms. The guy with the puppies just tensed up, bringing the puppies closer to his body and clamping his arms down on their small furry bodies. He'd stopped choking them, but the way he held them meant the poor things were now in danger of being crushed to death in the melee. There were like four or five of us cops on the guy at this point, trying to wrestle the puppies from him without causing any more damage. To my infinite relief, the drug-fueled maniac actually let go of one of the puppies thanks to one of my fellow officers prying his huge fingers away from this thing's body. I watched as a passerby picked up the seemingly lifeless body of the tan puppy, cradling the thing gently as he took it away from the scene. We were pretty much begging the guy to let go of the black puppy at this point, any more and there was no way it would survive such an ordeal. Its small juvenile body was being utterly crushed under the strength of this absolute whack job. I remember thinking, screw it, and decided to deploy my taser. It did nothing. Absolutely nothing. To think that the charge that had other suspects on the ground writhing in pain hadn't provoked even the smallest reaction from this guy, it's moments like this that really get you scared. The last thing I want to do is actually gun down a suspect for any reason, but... When someone is so high they can resist a taser, you're just edging closer and closer to the point where someone is going to have to end him. Just the thought makes me feel nauseous as I type this out. Like I said, there were about four or five cops on this guy, but we still found it necessary to call for additional backup. Only when two more cops rolled up did we actually manage to gain control and wrestle the black pit bull pup from this maniac's grip before we got the cuffs on him and dragged the scumbag into a patrol car. The two puppies were immediately transferred to an emergency animal clinic located in nearby Rockville, where both dogs were in critical condition. The tan-furred puppy's lungs were severely damaged from the death grip our drugged-up maniac had on it. They were filled with blood, causing him to vomit it up, and his chances of survival were slim. 
but after the best care the center could provide, the outlook for the male puppy was much brighter and he was expected to make a full recovery. The black female pit bull puppy was placed in poor condition, but she expected to make a full recovery as well. Both puppies had endured a horrific amount of trauma to their small infant bodies. James Edward Jones, a Wheaton resident, was sentenced to six months in prison for the shocking display of cruelty he displayed that night. In court, Jones explained he was deeply sorry and his defense was that he did not intentionally try to hurt the puppies that night. His attorney said he brought and smoked what he thought was just marijuana, but it turned out to be K2, a synthetic narcotic that has effects similar to angel dust, a street name for PCP. However, the presiding judge deemed that those reasons were not strong enough to excuse the violent attack. He was sentenced to the maximum punishment under a plea deal, six months in jail and five years of probation. Now just two years old, the puppies named Mia and Chance have received a rare second chance at a happy, healthy existence. My wife and I actually ended up adopting Chance, the tan puppy, and he now lives with us in our small family home. He's a good boy, an integral part of our family now, and I thank God every day that we've received such a blessing. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Also, this week I'm away on vacation, so I'll be having the talented Swamp Dweller and Mr. Davis standing in for me on Wednesday's and Friday's video. Be sure to show them some love, and I'll be back next week. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.